I'm really excited for today because we're going to be answering some questions from newer technicians in the field, asking questions about troubleshooting and what type of tools we use and why, and some of these procedures. So Ty, you're the perfect person to have here with me, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm honored. Thank you so much for having me back. I can't wait to see what's in store for us today. A technician by the name of Jim asks if you have the choice between using bead type probes or temperature clamps to measure the temperature, which one do you prefer on the refrigerant line? Well, my personal preference, I like the uh, the probes where I can just clamp them right on. Mm -hmm. I know there's one of the brands now has one that actually uses the metal itself. It uses the copper itself, uh, the conductivity of that copper mm -hmm. to yeah. get the temperature. And I don't understand how all of that science works in there, but I have found it to be more accurate. So you're know, using a little sandpaper on there, making sure you get a good conductivity and it gets me a good temperature. But I've many times in the past before we had temperature clamps is all we had was those that you had to tape on. And we had little Velcro ones for the fancy ones or, mm -hmm. or tape for the cheaper ones. And, uh, you know, it works. We just had to make sure we covered it back up, you know, insulated it. So it's getting the true line temperature. But it really, uh, my personal preference, like the clamps, it's just quick and easy and clamp yeah. it on there. I know I get a good contact. But the fact that you're getting that temperature and you're doing superheat and subcooling, you know, that's what I'm happy about. Yeah. So a couple different points. The, the manufacturer that, that uses the uh, temperature clamps that measures through the conductivity, uh, that is going to be a lot more precise than, say, a temperature clamp that has a bead-type temperature sensor mounted on a large, flat piece of aluminum metal that then has to then go touch the copper. And so a lot of them have a lot, large surface area. So not all uh, temperature clamps or probes are created equal. So that's an important thing to, to take into consideration. And so the other thing is the probes have a lot more going for them in the sense of then you can utilize something like Measure Quick and you can get a lot more data and uh, preciseness with it. Uh, as far as the B type temperature sensors, I do like the smaller surface area. And so uh, I'm a big fan of that because then you're really just measuring the tube if you cover it up, like you had mentioned, uh, with maybe tape or uh, insulation, make sure it's not in the sun. I just don't like that large surface area because you're, you're getting, say, air temperature from around it or the sun or something like that and potentially getting an inaccurate temperature. That's a good point. Um, in the older days before we actually had the clamps fully out, we just had those and those were the digital ones and everybody was super excited mm -hmm. about it. And I took a piece of, uh, of insulation from the, for the line, a piece of Armiflex, and I would actually stick that, uh, that bead type on the Armiflex and then put a regular clamp on the outside of it yeah. to get my temperatures. And at that time, it's just simply because I couldn't afford the clamps that came out. And there's only two brands that made the clamps. They had a wire on it. And then, uh, and then I remember when I finally got the clamp, I was so proud of it. You know, but uh, it was important because I was trying to make sure I got the temperature of that line without having to have the clamp in the way. And it is all those things come into it. But as long as you're being conscious of I want to get that temperature, that's, you know, that's that's a great step. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing that people don't take into consideration is the calibration of temperature sensors, uh, temperature meters, thermometers. So the the issue is some some have a uh, manual calibration screw, some have a digital calibration. You want to calibrate these things in 32 degree ice water as long as the manufacturer says that that can be used and you can adjust the temperature on the display to 32 degrees. You want to have a big tub of water and ice, primarily ice, and stick it in the middle. And uh, you want to wait, <laughs> wait a little bit before going and adjusting it. Uh, but that's a huge thing that people just don't take into consideration. They're just running around slinging tools on stuff. And well, is it working properly? Same thing with like multimeters. It's hey, I'm, I'm checking the resistance value, but when I just touch the probes together, I've got one ohm of electrical resistance. We sh should be reading no electrical resistance, 0.0, .0 ohms of electrical resistance. You have to use calibrated tools, uh, tools that you can either check yourself or that you can send back to the manufacturer, have them recalibrated and send out. Now, this is all stuff that has to be built you know, on the job sites. You have to build this into your pricing. It can't be something, it's like, it's not an afterthought because you're not going to do an afterthought. Right. And, and don't use an infrared thermometer for reading those temperatures because the reflectivity of that metal is going to change the numbers. And I've, I've seen that a lot. And the techs mean well, you know, so they, they're trying to get a temperature, but it's just not an accurate way of getting that temperature. Yeah, I agree. Another technician by the name of James asks, after you charged and achieved a proper subcoing on an R410A two-ton system, when you put back the liquid refrigerant left in your five-foot hose, how much will alter the subcoing and is it enough to worry about? Well, that's a really great question, and it depends on the system. Like a lot of systems, 
you know, it's, uh, you'll probably be okay. I, I know a lot of times I go ahead and put that back in, but if it's a critically charged system, then even that little bit in the hose is going to count. The next question is, where were you measuring from? So if you're taking that refrigerant out of the tank and you have that hose connected to your tank on the scale when it was zeroed out, then you're already accounting for that refrigerant in the hose anyway. So that refrigerant definitely needs to go back into that system. Yeah, so there's a couple ways to think about this. You could, if you're checking the refrigerant charge, instead of just weighing in the, the exact amount, if you're checking the refrigerant charge of a single speed system with a thermostatic expansion valve and you've got a target of 12 degrees of subcoiling and you reach 12 degrees of subcoiling, well, that's not necessarily the time to close the bottle down. So you could get to 11 degrees maybe and then close the bottle down then. And then you can charge the rest of that refrigerant into the system. But yeah, as far as subcoin goes, you might it might change it maybe a degree. It really depends on the system size, you know, as the amount of tubing on the system. Uh, but for a system with a piston orifice, I, I noticed that it really does change the superheat quite a lot. And if you're already down at, say, a target of six degrees and you're trying to charge to six degrees, you, you really don't want to do that because you're going to accidentally overcharge the system. And it could be a thing where you have liquid refrigerant entering the outdoor compressor because you have no superheat. So that's a, that's a big deal. You really want to try to close the refrigerant bottle down ahead of time uh, and charge it in. And sometimes, honestly, I maybe overcharge a, a system maybe by like one degree anyway. So it's it's not a whole lot for subcoin, but for when you're superheat and your superheat's very low, that's a, bit, that's a problem. But really, even if your target superheat is not 6 degrees and maybe it's 20 degrees of target superheat and you achieve 20 degrees of target superheat, that same system on another day could be running at 6 degrees of superheat. So, yeah, get it as close as possible. <laughs> I, I absolutely agree. Subcoating is a lot easier to work with because you got that plus or minus. It'll say plus or minus 1 or 2. And so that gives you that nice little you know window to work with. But I 100% agree. When you get with a fixed over meter device, they're so much more difficult to charge. And yeah, you, you definitely don't want to be taking compressors out. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the some, some systems have an accumulator on them. Uh, heat pumps almost always have an accumulator on them. So for running in between the two different uh, directional flow of the refrigerants, uh, between heating mode and air conditioning mode, that will help safeguard the compressor. But you still want to get as close as possible to that target. Uh, the accumulator, if you have saturated refrigerant and you have, say, no superheat, at least that accumulator is going to allow just vapor refrigerant into the compressor as long as the system's not overcharged because that's another thing where it overfills over the tubes inside the accumulator and hurts the compressor. Exactly. Right. We want to save compressors. We want the system to last as long as possible. But, yeah, ideally, yeah, you would close that down before you got – got to where you needed to be. And what I like to do instead of having to close that tank and then having to reopen it again, is I like to use those little ball valves and I'll put the ball valve side right up next to the tank so I can close that ball valve quickly and easily, just, you know, a quarter of a turn and it's completely closed and it's sometimes easier to work with and the actual valve on the tank itself. Yeah. Great point. Awesome. Just make sure you still close the tank though. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Great point. A technician by the name of John asks, uh, after pressure testing, I performed a triple evac. However, I actually... I've done 12 evacuations and nitrogen purges. On closing the vacuum pump off from the system, the micron jumps from 330 microns to 600 microns. So the thing is, if he vacuums it down again, it goes right back down to 330 microns, and then he shuts it off. It climbs to 1600. What could be the problem? Well, if it climbs to 1600 and then levels off, that means you still have moisture in the system. Now, if it climbs past 1600 and, and just nonstop slowly, then that means you definitely have a leak in that system. So a lot of times we think about, hey, I need to get it below 500, but we'll get below 500. And as soon as we shut it off, that moisture, it's on the lines. It's invisible everywhere. It starts boiling off and that raises the vapor pressure. And that's what you're reading. And that's why that blank off test is so incredibly important so that we know that we're getting all that moisture out of that system. And then again, a placement of, that, of the micron gauge. So was that micron gauge closer to the pump or is it closer to the system? Because the closer that micron gauge is to the pump, the faster that number is going to drop down. So I like to put my micron gauge as far from the pump as possible. Sometimes I'll even put a port on the inside unit so I can check microns at my evaporator coil inside while I'm pulling a vacuum outside. So that way I can get a more accurate number. So even if we're at 200 microns and it's at the pump, we could still be at 
5,000 microns in the system. Yeah. This could be that there's no problem whatsoever on this system, and they could just be measuring a micron level of 300 and whatever it was, 330 on the outside of the system, say, on the other side of the valve core. So that means that they're going to have to run the pump much longer. And you have to remember, if you're leaving that valve core in, your system is going to be at a uh, uh, a higher level, not a deep vacuum, compared to what you have outside because you're measuring the vacuum level closest to the pump. Then you have to remove the valve core. When you do that, you're going to get a, a more accurate vacuum reading of the entire system. And so that's really important. So that's that's one thing right there. It could be no problem at all, and you have to measure uh, the micron gauge at the port without the, the valve core. Uh, the second thing could be that, yeah, it, it's suspect if it rises up to exactly 1600 each time. If it, it was like rising at different numbers each time, uh, it, it could be it could be moisture, it could be a refrigerant uh, leak or a gasket leak or something like that. Not a refrigerant leak, but a hose leak, something like that. If it keeps only rising to 1600, that makes me wonder, maybe it's a gasket or maybe it's just something that reseals at 1600 microns, so like a possible leak in the hoses or something like that. Yeah, it's, it's a difficult one. It could be moisture, it could be a leak, it could be that you're not reading the right vacuum level inside the system and maybe it actually is 1600 in the actual system. And um, make sure you're using some kind of a valve, a vacuum rated valve at the pump. So if you're just shutting the pump off thinking that the check valve is going to hold it, it, it won't. The check valve, the whole job of that check valve is so when you shut it off, it doesn't pull the oil back out of the pump into the lines. So the check valve is not actually going to hold that vacuum. Yeah, that's a great, great point. And so not all valve core removal tools are created equal. So you have to see something that says 25 micron rated or 20 micron rated. That is extremely important. I've used many valve cores thinking, oh, I could just use this one. Well, no, that one leaked. That, that one leaks. This manufacturer leaks. This one leaks. And there's only several that I use to make sure that I that, that ball valve is rated for that. And even with the ball valve itself, you have to get the air out surrounding the ball of the valve before you turn it because then it will rise. And it's just because that little bit of air is trapped right there. It's it's funny. You just kind of have to do it a couple times. Make sure that you can do it once. Well, if you, if you know you can do it once, then you can do it again. You can repeat this. And you want to keep your vacuum hoses and your vacuum set up separate from the rest of your, your stuff. You don't want to use charging, charging hoses and gauges for your vacuum. I keep a dedicated vacuum set up, and it doesn't have to be very expensive either. It doesn't have to be some crazy thing. Yeah, but I keep keep caps on them too. Keep as much moisture out as possible. Anything to do to keep those hoses clean, dry, and tight so that when you need them, you're there. Yeah. A technician by the name of P asks, why do I keep finding so many evaporator coils leaking refrigerant? Wow, that's a, that's a loaded question. Uh, the two most common ones, one of them has to do with pulling a proper vacuum. If we don't pull a proper vacuum, the moisture stays in the lines. That moisture reacts with PLE oil and literally turns to an acid. That acid starts eating away the copper inside the system, and then that copper ends up in the compressor with what we call copper plating and shorten the compressor life. So some of the leaks are internal. The other big possibility for the leaks is external, and it was called ant nest corrosion. And it has to do with a lot more chemicals that we have in the house nowadays. A lot of all the building supplies, all the components, all the plastics, all the stuff off gases. And these chemicals go across that into the air, across the evaporator coil, and you have copper, you have aluminum, you have galvanizing on the, the plates, and you have moisture all reacting against each other. So that speeds up that reaction, that, that chemical process there. And so whether people call it corrosion, so people call it all these different different names on it. Um, I can't think of even all the names they go into, but there's been a lot of studies on that, and they found that it's coming external. Those are your, probably your two biggest reasons. Yeah. Yeah, the, the galvanized plate where the where it touches the metal. I mean, if you see rust there, that's most likely where you want to go to do your leak searches. And a lot of manufacturers, unfortunately, they make them the tubes very thin. They increase the surface area on the inside. It's not just looking like a smooth tube on the inside. They have ridges to increase the surface area. And they're just super thin. So any type of external corrosion on the outside or on the inside, it doesn't take that much to then end up having a leak at that location. So... That would be why. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I definitely want to go to the manufacturers and say, hey, build a better coil that doesn't leak. I mean, I, I want to go up and, and, and say that. But on the other hand, the manufacturers, they have the DOE, Department of Energy, 
gives them all these regulations saying it has to be this efficient and it has to be more efficient. And to get the efficiency out of it, you put those ridges, that rifling to make the refrigerant spin. You have to make it thinner because that's better heat transfer. So there's some of the things that, you know, they have, it's not all their fault. They have other things they're responsible for, but you know, there's a big picture on that. Yes, I would like for us to come together with regulations and manufacturers together and say, hey, let's mandate that these things don't leak for 10 years. I, I think that would be a great solution, but there is a bigger picture. I'd love to just blame one manufacturer or just blame this, but the reality is it's a little bit more complicated than that. And it is absolutely aggravating uh, that a customer buys a unit and it's leaking in a few years. It's just to me, it's unacceptable. We have to solve that. No, I, I agree completely, 100%. That's what I was going to say. It's just five years, you know, and having a leak, that customer's going to be mad at the installer thinking that you installed cheap equipment and it's not you at all. We put our heart and soul into these jobs and you want to do best. You want to have a good name out there and it makes us look foolish, you know, bad, you know, or whatever. And so you could also have, uh, like you had said, a bunch of chemicals, you could have uh, solvents in the room or whatever, and you have a ductwork leak and you're sucking that across the coil or whatever, you know, or it's, you know, just pulling it from the return or, you know, you have air coming from an area that like the garage or something, you know, where it's sucking in uh, not good air with, with VOCs and things like that, that could eat away at it. But it's, it's just not a good thing. If you remember at one point in time, they had some sheetrock that came from another country and that sheetrock had a lot of sulfur in it. And it was actually the sulfur from the off gas of the sheetrock that was causing the copper to corrode. It actually caused the copper to turn black and it's literally eating the copper away. So in some cases like that, that's, you know, an external force that, you know, the manufacturer can't fully account for. So there are some reasons. <laughs> Another technician by the name of Jacob asks, why do some customer ceiling registers drip water when the AC is on and some do not? Sometimes there's mold too. Well, the, the absolutely simplest answer to that is because some grills are below the dew point temperature and some grills are not. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the issue is the humidity level inside inside the house and, and temperature. So that's what we're talking about. Um you could also have uh, issues where you're not insulating the the boot up in the attic, you know, all of that type of thing, uh, and you you just you could have an oversized system. You're just not taking the humidity out of the building. You're just lowering the temperature, and that's what's creating that issue. Just like you said, a lot of customers and techs too look at temperature in the house. They think, well, if I want this temperature, it makes me happy, or this is the temperature I need to be. But we have to look at humidity. See how much moisture is in the air? Because that moisture in the air is going to depend on how that customer feels. You know, if you're at two different two different climates and uh, they're both 75 degrees, but one's at 80% humidity and one's at 10% humidity, you're going to definitely feel a difference. One's going to feel cold and the other one's going to feel warm. So humidity is a factor. But as technicians, we should start looking at dew point. We have our psychrometers. It has that number in there for dew point. And that number is so important because anything below that number, we're going to have condensation. It's going to start dripping water. That's where your tea glass is dripping water or anything that's around. But that evaporator coil needs to be below the dew point temperature so that we're dehumidifying. So we're looking yeah. at our saturated temperature. Let's say, hey, whatever that saturated temperature is, we want that below the dew point. So we're pulling that moisture out of the air. So that's another way we look at that number, but also inside the house, anything below that dew point temperature, that's going to be an issue. And the grills are often a lot of times below the dew point issue. Uh, the dew point temperature. So we want to see what that dew point is. And is the dew point, the moisture level in the house too high? Maybe we need to look at that as the answer. Or then we can look at it. Hey, the, the moisture level in the house is quite low. This is still happening. Let's look at the airflow. Maybe the air is moving too slow. Maybe it's not insulated correctly. Maybe there's a gap between the boot and the ceiling. And it's actually pulling that air in from the attic. And that air seems dry, but once it hits that yeah. cooler boot, it starts condensating yeah. and it starts dripping. And you'll oftentimes see this in a bathroom. When I see it in the bathroom, I think, yeah. hey, that's a great sign of not to fix the boot itself, but let's look at how can we get the moisture out of the bathroom, such as a exhaust fan with the timer mm -hmm. built into it or one that's automatically controlled in humidity. When you see that, that's great that you're looking at that and thinking about that. We want to fix that before it turns into a a growth issue. I don't like to call it mold because I'm not a certified mold technician, but we want to look at that and say, hey, let's start identifying this early on and dew point, start looking at dew point. You go around and build that curiosity. You wonder what the dew point is in this house, in that house, outside, inside, and even on a house itself. As you drop the temperature of the house and the indoor temperature of the house has a dew point temperature, uh, you bring the temperature of the house lower than the dew point temperature outside. So the physical temperature in the house is below the dew point temperature of the outside of the house. 
you're going to have condensation. Where is that condensation happening? Windows, doors, but also it could be happening in the walls, in the insulation between the house. So when you start looking at Dewpoint, it can really take you to a whole other world we call building science. And it's definitely worth doing because that's where you're unlocking and you're solving whole house problems yeah. and whole house issues. But Dewpoint is so important for us to look at. And if you're thinking about the condensation on that, that's a great point to start looking at the whole system. We like to look at fixing these equipment. That's great. We go out, we fix the unit. Customer's happy. Like we feel like kings, like yeah. everybody's happy. But we got to look at, hey, a lot of times these problems are outside of just that appliance. Looking at the ductwork, the insulation, the house being sealed, the comfort of that customer. And dew point yeah. is the first step for getting into that new world. Yeah. Uh, building science is, is now becoming cool, which is awesome. Uh, I, I really see a lot of people caring about that more. And uh, I come from a family of, of carpenters. And so I always kind of looked at the 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 building as a whole, you know, when you're doing say system sizing and things like that. And so it's, it's really important. Um, you brought up another point about the, the airflow and then, you know, the humidity up in the attic, you know, and you're sucking that hot humid air into, into the return. You have situations like that. You have situations where maybe the, the blower motor is, is sized too high you know, for the air conditioning system. And so you're not bringing the temperature of the evaporator cool down low enough to even remove the humidity, you know, <laughs> at a, an efficient rate. And so, yes, you're lowering the temperature, but you're not lowering the humidity. And so you have different issues happening, you know, but like you said, as far as the registers being very low in temperature because that you have a low temperature air because your airflow is too low, that is, is one of those situations where you have that high humidity dripping, uh, being attracted to that cold register, you know, and, and dripping there. And so, yeah, you need to have the, the house built in such a way where you don't have all of that humid air kind of coming into the building. Uh, maybe through cracks, windows, doors, and things like that. Um, you need to have everything sealed properly. There's a lot of things that affect this, and it's it's not just the system. It's the building, and it's the the separations of the building, and and where the system's installed. If it's up in the attic, or if it's inside the 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 house, you know, it's there's a lot to it. Absolutely, it's a it's a beautiful system when you see it all come together. Yeah. You'll see it's a lot more in places like Miami than you would in places like uh, Las Vegas, where it's very dry in the desert. However, you'll still see it in Las Vegas that when the when it actually does rain, humidity goes up, and then we get calls of people saying, "Hey, I got my uh, my vents are dripping," and it's been a problem the whole time. These issues are still there. It's just now it's been a point where they can they can see it happening. Yeah, yeah, all because of the building. Another technician by the name of Jack asked, "What's the difference between a four port, a three port, and those probes when working on refrigerant and systems?" Uh, that's a great question, and really, it comes down to. Uh, weight and refrigerant loss. So mm -hmm. one of the things I love about probes, and it took me a while to fully in, in, embrace the probes, but what I love about the probes is the fact that it's so much easier to carry and there's no refrigerant loss. So even on in your best bet with hoses, you're losing the refrigerant in the hose itself. And when you put the probes on, there's no refrigerant loss. It's just that little, that little small, small amount. The second thing for me is contamination. When I take the probes on and off, there's no contamination. A lot of times when technicians take the gauges off, they take them off, they get the refrigerant hose and they bleed it across the manifold. Well, what's in that manifold? Was it refrigerant from the last unit? Was it air? Was it contaminants? You're literally pushing that contaminants through the manifold back into the system. And I've seen non-condensables in really great systems just because people are checking the charge on it. So that's a big issue with hoses altogether. And then the four port side, the idea behind the four port was great. We had the large hose for pulling a vacuum. We can pull a vacuum faster. But the downside of the four port manifold, and I have several of them at the house, is that you're still pulling your vacuum through those little bitty hoses. And so I found the best way to pull a vacuum is don't use the manifold at all. From the hoses, from the equipment, straight to my vacuum pump. So me personally, I don't ever use my four port manifold anymore. Or the one that I do have that is digital, I've taken the vacuum hose off to make it lighter because it's just simply a lot of extra weight for me. This is my opinions on here. Yeah. Uh, but I have really, uh, I like just a regular three port manifold or a digital three port manifold. And it took me a while, but I really love the probes now. So I do agree. Uh, four port manifolds, I don't see really any reason for them. I don't think that we should be recovering through them. I don't think that we should be uh, vacuuming through them. And so manifolds are meant for charging, positive pressure, not usually for vacuuming. And even when they were designed for vacuuming, the digital ones, even there seemed to be some issues with that. 
Uh, the contamination that you're speaking of, I mean, every time we disconnect uh, our hoses from a system, you're going to have oil in there. And depends on like how well you keep your hoses in, in the truck. If you, you keep them open, your truck is humid. You know what I mean? Like all of the oil in there is going to get contaminated. It's going to be just sucking up the moisture. And, and then you have this old oil with all this moisture. You're literally putting that right into the system. The next time you're checking the charge, because you're like, I'm putting the gauges on there to see, you know, if it's superheat or subcoin, it is possible to uh, check the refrigerant charge with just uh, temperature sensors, you know, but you have to know where the, say, the middle of the the saturation is occurring in the coil, or at least r basically right after the metering device where the refrigerant enters the coil at, that's a possibility. I always wished that uh, manufacturers would take one of those little U-tubes, right, and like right where the refrigerant enters from the metering device into the distributor tubes into, say, the evaporator coil, and they just would take that U-tube and come right out of the front of the case and put like a little plastic cover over it. Then we can just measure the temperature right there. We have our saturated temperature. So remember, every time we check pressure, it's just to measure our saturated temperature, and we don't have to be connecting old hoses with old oil into the system and all that type of stuff. So, yeah, we're, we're always concerned about the refrigerant that we're pulling out of the system accidentally when checking the refrigerant charge and what we do with that afterwards. The probes are, are really good. There is a little bit like if you have like a charging tee, I still say purge that just a little bit because there's a little bit of air there. Uh, so on the high side, if it's an air conditioning system, you can just connect the probe right in. You might want to access tea when you connect with a probe onto the vapor side, you know, in case you need to add something instead. You, you know, if you attach it on there, and then you say, oh, I'm low on refrigerant and you need to add something or some, you know, like maybe six ounces, maybe four ounces or something like that. You know, then you have to take it back off, put the tea on, then put it back on again. You know, you have all of those uh, situations and the probes. Now we have these um, automatic calculations that are occurring, you know, with the the wireless probes with measure quick. And uh, that's also a beautiful thing you could if you don't have electron electronic probes you could even use test gauges or uh digital gauges um and you can just measure your pressure and your saturated temperature right there uh so either way you know i would just try to avoid the hoses whenever possible so three port manifold or test gauges or probes and so the probes are are i would say best and that would be for a say experienced technician you know, um, because all the calculations are getting done for you. I like to see like students still connecting with the hoses and the the manifold gauge sets so they can understand what's happening, what's connected to what, you know, and measuring the pressures and converting and doing the calculations for superheat and subcoin themselves and thinking about it so that once they get to these automatic calculation, you know, devices, uh, when there's a problem, and I don't mean just bad batteries. I just mean like a troubleshooting problem. They can think through it in order to solve the issue. Right. Understanding what those numbers mean. I, it really frustrates when I see a technician, they, they call me and say, I have a problem. They're giving me pressures because pressures don't mean I need, I need temperatures. I want to know what my yeah. superheat, what my subcooling is. Yeah. Uh, when I teach, I definitely, I don't like to start out teaching with probes at all. Yeah. But what I do use instead of the hoses is that I call it the lollipops. So yeah. it's the red and the blue and there's no hoses, no manifold. Yeah. It's just a, it's just, just like the probes are. It connects right on the gauges. You get the pressure, convert it to a saturated temperature, uh, and you had the same thing. There's there's no loss. And I've got to see firsthand how much contamination can happen in a lab. We had systems that were all brand new, and after a week of doing labs, of just simply putting hoses on and off, we had massive contamination mm -hmm. in those systems. So uh, we changed how we did the hoses on and off, but then it just went to, hey, let's use a lollipop like we used to use in refrigeration. Yeah. And, man, it solved so many of those issues. So I could still get students to see Hey, understanding that needle and the pressure, manually converting it to temperature, manually taking the, the temperatures of the lines and getting their superheat and subcooling and still have the benefits of the probes, you know, with, with still manually making sure we understand where those numbers are coming yeah. from. I never heard the lollipop reference before. I've always just called them quick connect test gauges. You know, uh, you're yeah, like, four, like four letters or four words. Sorry. You've got one. They're like, oh, man, maybe you should just call it a lollipop from now on. Uh, yeah. And there, there's it's no song for, uh, no. for for your word. But if you have a lollipop song, there's a song that goes yeah, with that. There you go. <laughs> Technician by the name of Frank asks, one of my customers has an outdoor air conditioner that turns on sometimes and others it doesn't. So what should I look for first? So my first inclination on that would be that you're losing your 24-volt signal. 
Uh, maybe that's the case. Maybe your contactor, maybe that's uh, pitted and sometimes it's closing, sometimes it's not. And so it, if it happens when it, after it rains outside and maybe, maybe then it's, it's running, but when it's dry, it's not, maybe, maybe it's just a, a wire nut, like a rusty wire nut connection or something like that. But the whole object is what we do is we just uh, go out to the outdoor unit, make sure that uh, we're measuring our power, take the shroud off, measure our low voltage, make sure that we have good 24 volt uh, voltage. Anytime we have an intermittent problem, uh, you might want to be wiggling that thermostat wire, see if anything changes. Um, you, you need to do something. I've been on service calls when I started out with a service tech, uh, not with my the good company, but the, the what I would consider the not so good company that I started with before them. Uh, they went out to an intermittent service call four times before they realized it was just a loose connection. And I'm just, I'm, I'm there as the junior technician, just like smacking my hand up against my head. Cause this is the first time I was there on his fourth call to this place with an intermittent issue. And intermittent is definitely the most aggravating ones because, you know, you can't see the problem and you have to really think about all the things that could be in trial and error. And nobody wants to go back to that same house. Uh, one of the things that I found is an energy monitor sometimes works. They can actually find out, you know, when exactly it's happening. For example, we had one customer that said his, their unit was making this loud clack, 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 clack noise, but only at a certain time every day. And we had to be there at that exact time to catch it. And it turns out that there was a woodpecker pecking on the flue pipe of the furnace. And it was just completely unusual stuff. So like sometimes <laughs> that your best intentions just have some really oddball, but really we should be embracing those intermittent calls because those are the ones that really challenge us. We have to think outside the box. We can't just find, hey, what's broken? We have to really think about all the things that could cause that. And I love those as frustrating as they are because they really challenge us and they make us grow. Yeah. Yeah. It could be maybe a relay even on the circuit board of the furnace or the air handler. It could be that, you know, there could be a lot of different things and you, you need to check all of your electrical connections with the power off. And uh, you want to make sure that it's not just something um, maybe, uh, they didn't strip the wire back far enough, or maybe when they stripped the thermostat wire, they scarred it. Maybe they ran diagonal pliers around it and squished the wire, and it's just barely making a connection, and sometimes it's not. There's all kinds of stuff that you, you need to be able to look for, and you can spot real quickly. When you see that, you can go ahead and fix it. You never go to an intermittent service call and just do testing. You are testing and also with the power off you are doing something you know checking the wire nuts retightening you're tightening all your connections while you're taking your measurements and there's other things that you could do you could add like a, a delay at the outdoor unit so something that uh, makes sure that you're not just sending like uh, a power to the outdoor unit every 30 seconds and then it's shutting off and then the compressor is trying to turn back on again there's different things that you can do to safeguard the compressor and the outdoor unit um but yeah, you, your multimeter is your best friend and safety is your best friend. And you just need to know where to start at, which you can start measuring your low voltage at the contactor outside and then work back into the indoor unit. Or you might just move forward from there and maybe you are checking for a voltage drop across the contactor or maybe you're going to be... Uh, with the power off to the outdoor unit, maybe you can check the electrical resistance on the contactor. You know, you can visually inspect it and see if it's burnt. There's a lot of things that you can do. Exactly right. That's about all the time we're going to have to answer questions today. I really appreciate this time that I'm getting to spend with you. And uh, it's just an awesome privilege, brother. Thank you so much, Ty. Oh, thank you. This is always so enjoyable getting to talk to another colleague, talk to a friend, talk to somebody as a mentor. You know, it's really great having this. And I think uh, everybody out there should find somebody else that be able to have these conversations with, talk to, and, uh, and, and keep asking these questions, keep learning. You know, as much as I love this and talk about it all the time, you know, even talking about some of the, the normal questions here with you and seeing your viewpoint uh, and, and we both care about it and we're both trying to learn. And I think it's just great just being refreshed on some of these questions. It's been really awesome. Yeah. So if you have more questions that you want to get answered from Ty, you can ask them in, say, the comment section under his videos. So you can look up some of the topics. Just look up Ty Brenneman and love to HVAC. And also you can check out some of our videos and check out our website over at acservicetech.com where we've got, uh, we've got the podcast, we've got quizzes and articles and all that stuff there for you. So, so once again, I enjoyed, enjoyed this time with you. Thanks so much. Thank you, man.